Winter 521CE. Subject C hasn't moved within his enclosure all day. He's resting on the ground, staring intently at the glass surrounding him, for no discernible reason to us. Even for Eden and Supper, he's yet to move an inch. It's quite the blight, as the body's stench has accumulated more over time. He just stares, unmoving. This came as quite a shock to Ferris and I, as Subject C usually becomes frenzied when brought near a corpse. Yet, nothing. Late into the night, Subject A rose from her slumber and released a deafening screech, waking every living being in the facility easily. The shaken floor somehow stirred even Subject C to an upright position, looking attentively toward the Alpha. You are our weeks of studying the relationship between an Alpha Megalodont and a subordinate Megalodont brought many interesting questions into our hands. While not appearing to be reasonably intelligent creatures, they have a strong sense of social hierarchy and their place in their society, if it could be called that. Subordinate Megalodonts tend to pay close attention to the alpha of their territory for reasons we cannot understand. Subject A has expressed an impressive ability to bring a creature as lazy as Subject C to his feet. A feat unsurmountable to us, meager scholars. As it has been a notably long time since Subject C has eaten, he finally began to motion toward his now hours old dinner. Yet, Subject A had seemed to deny this, taking the meal for herself. Astounding, isn't it? Ferris wouldn't believe me if I told him twice. Once the excitement died down, I returned to slumber. Today, the realization has hit that we lack additional food for our dear subjects. Last night's meal for Subject C was the last body on hand. Unfortunately, it is winter. Pathfinders tend to be shaky during this time of year. It's more difficult to find gullible, bright-eyed, hopeful ones. During the last winter, we prepared a surplus of bodies in preparation for this. This winter, however, we became careless. Too much time spent on experimentation and studying, of course. But I do not want to end my studies here, and a Megalodon's appetite is marvelous. I'll contemplate my options. I'm determined to see these experiments through to the end. I'm writing once more, only a few hours past my previous entry. I've prepared a new meal for my subjects. I still need to wash myself first, as I do not want the smell of blood luring them towards myself instead of their meal. Despite this being all I can provide for now, I'm happy to say it will at least satisfy subject A. He's my primary research target at the moment, after all. Surely, her subordinates will understand. And if not, I've seen beautifully gruesome combat between megalodonts, almost akin to mankind scuffles. Truly a fascinating spectacle to witness. I fed the last of my food supply to Subject A, dropping the body into the enclosure as she did last night. She consumed it happily as the other two subjects watched. I used this opportunity to gain the best look I possibly could muster at the coarse coral along her back. A beautiful, natural weapon, capable of slaughtering hundreds of pathfinders within mere moments. Its ability to launch almost needle-like projectiles at such high speeds is beautifully lethal. It mainly occurs when the Megalodon is under high stress as a last-ditch defense mechanism. I fear I have stared too long, though as the other subordinates seemed more interested in me than ever before, I made sure to engage in a swift exit. There's something marvelous about these creatures, some sort of almost mankind-like understanding between each other, yet to us, they're simply considered monsters. You all fail to see its social prowess, without not even a consideration of the possibilities. What if we were able to exploit this hierarchy for our own purpose? for my own purpose, for your own purpose.